In this episode, we're joined by Dr. John Delaney, a leading expert in counseling and mental health. Dr. Delaney, author of Building a Non-Anxious Life and host of the Dr. John Delaney Show, shares simple yet powerful strategies for overcoming anxiety and finding balance in our daily lives. Dr. Delaney reveals practical techniques from his book that can help you navigate life's challenges with greater ease. Today, you will learn how you can take steps towards a more balanced and fulfilling life. Welcome back to another episode of The Mindful Space. Today, I have the pleasure of having Dr. Deloney. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for uh, making this happen, taking the time to speak with us today. So I want to start, well, from the beginning. Um, for those who might not know who you are, do you mind introducing yourself and letting our audience know what is it that you do? Um, I'm John, and I was born and raised in... Texas. And I guess as a Texan, I have to make sure everybody knows that about me, which is pretty annoying. <laughs> um, and I'm married to a brilliant, um, awesome wife. And I've got two kids and um, a whole bunch of chickens. And I live out here in Nashville, Tennessee. Chickens. Yeah. We, we got all kinds of animals out on our place. Okay. Um, but live out here in Nashville. And I spent the better part of two decades working in universities, working with young people and their families as things fell apart and, um, and as things went really, really well and as a professor. And then the last few years, um, I also, also worked with police departments doing crisis response and helping when things just really got sideways. And in the past few years, I've, um, left the university and started writing and speaking and have, uh, a show that I, that I, uh, host every every day the host yeah that i host yeah i was trying to think of the right <laughs> word that i host um and it's just been a wild ride ever since uh, i left the universe yeah you i feel like you've done a little bit of everything yeah. uh now it's the podcast and you also have a book that came out recently correct correct yeah um i wanted to ask you a couple questions about that but first i wanted to to really dig in into what is it like how did you get to this space what inspired you to write the book um, it's called building a non-anxious life um, and what key messages do you hope to to bring to your readers yeah I think um, my experience working with people over the last 20 years is this that the environment's definitely changed and I think we all know that right those books are out there and I've had my own challenges with really for lack of better terms, having everything. My parents are still married. They've been married for 50 something years. I grew up in Texas. I've been a six foot two male for my whole life since I was like in seventh grade, right? Um, I kind of had it all mapped out, laid out for me. And yet I was also chasing achievement and um, I just wanted somebody to tell me they're proud of me, right? And I want somebody to, to tell me that I had value. And so I thought I would get that with titles and achievement and money. And that's that story's been out there. That story's been written. And so mm -hmm. I've got my personal experience and I've got all these other experiences with these folks. But the biggest challenge that I've run up against over and over and over again is what I would call this culture of disempowerment, this culture that tells us that, hey, you're the worst thing that ever happened to you. And if your body responds okay. to these challenges in a certain way, you have this. You are somehow less than you are not working properly. You're broken. You're a pathology. And so you need to sit over there in the corner. We'll pat you on the head and somebody's going to come get you. We'll solve it for you because clearly you can't. And I've just had a ringside seat to the least of these in our communities. Folks with the, da the, the deck stacked so far against them do extraordinary things. And folks who were born with every type of, of gift known to man who have struggled and then overcome. So – the point of this book, I guess, was to pull back the layers and say, hey, all anxiety is is an alarm system. Like it doesn't it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're broken. And since the anxiety levels continue to escalate through the roof, we're the most medicated society in human history. On top of that, we're the most therapized society in human history. More people are under the care of a licensed mental health practitioner than ever before in human history. And yet the rates continue to skyrocket then we have to say, okay, what's mm -hmm. actually the issue here? And the issue here is we've created a world that our bodies can't exist in. We've created a chaotic, frenetic world and said, this is normal. And if your body responds to it by getting anxious, by not being able to sleep, by not being want to be intimate or connected, um, then you're broken. There's something wrong with you. And I just reject that wholeheartedly. 
um, having walked those shoes mm-hmm. and having sat with people. I just, I, I, I think people are worth more than that. And so the point of the inspiration of writing the book, one, the publishing team after my last book said, hey, this is the one you're going to write next. And so <laughs> there is that. Um, but the, the bigger picture was <laughs> uh, there's got to be a counter narrative to there's something wrong with you. Um, yeah. You're broken. Instead of thinking, what if my body's right? It's it's the the physiological changes, right, that that come up with the anxiety, but it doesn't mean that you're broken. They come and go, right? right? Emotions, feelings, uh, physiological changes. I know you refer um, of anxiety a lot as a smoke alarm in your kitchen, right? Could you elaborate on this concept and and share a little bit of the understanding anxiety is? Um, how it is in this way that shapes your approach to overcoming it. Yeah. So if, if anxiety is the problem, then the goal is to get, to get rid of the problem. But if anxiety is just the smoke alarm in your kitchen and it's letting you know that, Hey, something's on fire around here, then the fire is what's actually the issue. So what I mean by that in technical, I mean, in, in more of an everyday language, if you keep mm-hmm. snapping awake at two thirty in the morning, if you find yourself um, snapping at your kids that you who you love, if you find yourself not wanting to be romantic with your romantic partner that you love dearly, those are core physiological things. That's that's core to humanity. So instead of saying, "Man, you know what I really need to fix is my sleep," a smarter question might be, or not smarter, a a more honest answer may be, what is my body detecting in this home, in these relationships, in my finances, in my work life? What what threats in my life do my body keep recognizing that it wakes me up at 3 a.m. every night? Because we know that okay. it can't function without sleep. And so for it to wake us up, it really is terrified. What's it terrified of? And that is a much more instructive question than... How can I duct tape mm-hmm. over this smoke alarm so I don't hear it anymore and go back to sleep? Take the battery out. Right, I'm going to take the battery out or I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna get a pillow and duct tape it over the, the alarm. And then your yeah, house yeah. is going to burn down, right? And so I think we've been trying to play whack-a-mole with symptoms, whack-a-mole with challenges. And here's the other uh, annoying part about anxiety. When you are anxious about something, social issues, um, your uh, it, it, phobias, any number of things we have anxiety about. When you avoid those things, so let's say you're, you have social anxiety disorder or other people just make you anxious and you get invited to a company event where you're going to get an award and you start getting nervous the moment you get that email. Your heart starts beating a little faster when you think about it. What am I going to wear? I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't do this. And then you yeah. don't go. You find yourself with a cold. Your body hooks you up. It lets you have an off ramp. I'm sick. I don't feel good. There's an emergency. I got to go deal with my mom, Mm. whatever. Your body learns that it got what it wanted because it identified this, this event at work as a threat and it got what it wanted. You avoided that threat. And so what happens is your anxiety actually gets stronger when you avoid the things that you're anxious about. The only way to actually deal with those alarms is to go deal with the alarms. And so in counseling, it's, it's, it's one of the truest, most, um, most known – few things in therapy are do this and you'll probably get better. Yeah. This is one of those. It's exposure. Like we can gradually introduce you to this thing that your mm-hmm. body's telling you is not safe, whether it's a snake or an airplane or f- people or whatever. We can gradually get you there and we're going to teach your body that if it, it's okay, right? And that's the only way forward. What does that mean? That means the only way to deal with fear or anxiousness around your finances is to get out a piece of paper and write down who do you owe money to and what is our plan? The only way to deal with relational challenges, anxiety with your teenagers is to sit down with a professional and learn or a book or your teenagers and say, hi, I'm dad and I haven't done this right. I would like to get to know you again, right? There's only the only way to feel less anxious is to head right into it. And that's really hard. Yeah, it is really hard. Um, with the describing the exposure therapy, um, people think there's an easy way out, right? Like, I don't know. You have to move forward, baby steps, but exposure little by little. And that, that, and that you said that is particularly for anxiety. Well, yeah, that, that you said that's so important is um, one of the last chapters in the book is 
discussing, cho- you're going to choose your hard. Like being a hundred pounds overweight, that's hard to do life every day, right? It's just, cha- it's more challenging. Your knees, your comfort, your clothes, it's just harder. And losing a hundred pounds is very, very hard. So it's not a matter of one of these paths is easier than the other. It's like having a marriage that you are six inches apart, but 6,000 miles away from each other. That's hard. Having a lonely marriage is hard. Mm-hmm. And sitting across the table from somebody else who loves you, but also knows all your buttons and saying, let's rebuild something new. That's, <laughs> that's, definitely that's hard too, right? They're, it's both hard. But the, the, I think the illusion yeah. is there's an easy path and a hard path. It's not. They're both hard. So why not choose the hard one that's going to lead to healing on the other side? Yeah, exactly. And only you know which path is the one that's going to serve you, right? It doesn't mean you have – there's no correct or wrong path. You choose whatever serves you at that I think moment. every path has consequences um, and trade-offs. Yeah, exactly. Um, when you – when we talk about daily choices for a non-anxious living – with your book, you outlined six daily choices. Okay, I want to dig a little bit into that. Can you provide maybe some examples for our audience? Um, some of these choices or explain the significance of them. Yeah, sure. Is there a, any specific choices you want to you want to talk through, or you want to go through all of them? No. Um, if you want, mention all of them, and then maybe go a little deep into maybe what you consider to be the top two or the most sure. important ones. So. Um... Let's start with the challenge to the, even the idea of choices, and then we'll work down to the individual ones. Um, okay. As a guy who has just been doubled over with anxiety before, the idea that I would choose anxiety is so maddening to me, right? So somebody saying, oh, so there's six choices, so I cho- I'm choosing anxiety. No, nobody chooses that. But – we do choose to create an ecosystem or remain in an ecosystem or not seek healing from an ecosystem that causes the alarms. So are you walking around your house lighting fires? No. no. Are you in a incense? Maybe. <laughs> there fires, you go. That's no. right. But <laughs> but are you in a home that is surrounded that is lit up? Absolutely. And so when I say choices, I want to look at all of the things. Um, that might set my body's alarms off, and I'm going to begin to deal with those. And my guess is that instead of climbing up and taking the batteries out of the smoke detector to stop the alarm, if I go around my home and put out the fires, then the alarm's going to go off because there's no more smoke. And so the first one of those is I have to choose on a daily basis. I have to choose reality. And we hear this all the time that we live in the um, we live in the attention economy. That's a very nice way of saying we live in the distraction economy. Look over here. Look at this light. Look at this. Look, 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 yeah. look, look, look. The goal for all commerce, all media is to avoid mindfulness. This, this idea of being present. The whole goal is mm-hmm. someone's coming for you. Someone's going to try to take your stuff. And I got the product or the, the, uh, the, op- the, solution. the solution, the opinion that'll solve it all. That's right. <laughs> Madness. Yeah. Right. So what do I mean when I say you have to choose reality? How much money do you owe? And if you owe a bunch of money, we'll talk about this in a bit, your body would be failing you if it let you sleep all night knowing that if you just say one wrong thing at work and get fired, you're going to lose your home. You're going to lose your cars. Mm -hmm. Um, It would be failing you if it let you sleep all night knowing your marriage is falling apart and you and your partner are both smiling, pretending it's all good. You're great co-managers of your house. Your kids get where they need to go. Everybody gets to work. Every, the lunches get made and the dishes get done. But y'all are living two separate lonely lives. Your body would be failing you if it let you sleep, right? Because it's it's telling you, hey, there's a problem. So choosing reality is yeah. taking an inventory of your life. What are the relationships with my kids? What about my family? Do I have community? Do I have friends that I can lean on when things get heavy? That's choosing reality. The next one is choosing connection, and we've created the loneliest generation in human history, and that's just been written about ad nauseum, so I don't need to beat that drum. I'm sure you talked about this on your show, but um, we're just – everybody's lonely. Your body would be failing you if it let you sleep all night knowing that you are the only person in your tribe. It's got to get your attention and let you know you got to get people, you got to get people, you got to get people. And by the way, making adults – I mean making friends as an adult, as a 40-year-old – is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> it's so awful. It's the, it's terrible, man. It is. 
It so is. Weird. I just saw a funny meme the other day, the comedian saying, you know, making friends in middle school is great. You just go say, I love your green shirt. You're my new favorite friend. I love green. You love green. We're best friends. <laughs> it's like at 40, imagine getting to work and say, I love your green shirt. You'd be like, yeah, okay, then someone calls HR on you. you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like harassment. <laughs> exactly. So uh, it's hard. It, it, there's no doubt about it. We've created a very isolated, lonely, touch free society. And our bodies are dying. They're dying. And so the alarms are being so are, are sounding, right? The third one is you have to choose freedom. And what I mean by freedom is if you owe money to somebody, the bank is telling you what you will do tomorrow, not you. The the car finance the, the car financing dealership, they're telling you, I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you just had a newborn. You're gonna go to work tomorrow because I run your life because you owe me. And if you go through 15 years ago, my wife and I decided, dude, let's just, it's, it's part of me getting well. I don't want to owe anybody anything at all, ever, ever. 15 years of old Corollas and absurd trucks that may or may not start when I turn the key, like embarrassing things of hand me down clothes. Okay. And my colleagues, I was a dean of students at a law school. I was a dean of students at one of the top universities in the country. My colleagues been like, Wow, that's what you drive, huh? <laughs> right? Like it's, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the trade off was I can walk out the door today when I have an abusive boss. I can walk out the door today if, if there's a mm -hmm. committee and they say, hey, we need you to do something that's a little bit sketchy. Um, I can walk out the door yeah. if my partner be suddenly, my wife would never, but if, if she suddenly became abusive, right? It's, it's your body knows whew, we're free. Same with calendar. We have calendars that are so bananas packed now that if you miss five minutes, if you're five minutes late at eight o'clock on Monday morning, your whole week falls over, right? And yeah. we're surrounded by clutter. Our homes are so full of junk for bodies designed for scarcity. Um, uh, I forgot the, I'm, I, just, yeah. I just misplaced his name. He is a Japanese minimalist. He's amazing. I wrote about him in the book. Um, I can't believe I just, I just lost his name Ooh. here. But he uh, he he has a really poignant quote. He says, every inanimate object in your home is having a conversation with you at all times. And I thought, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And then I walked in my basement yeah. and I got real quiet. And I have I have like an office <laughs> set up down there. And my book started slowly whispering okay. quietly. Are you just going to be stupid forever? You're not going to read us anymore? Like, like all those books on my shelf that I haven't read yet. Like, oh, you're okay. just not going to. And then my... You know, my hobbies were in the corner of my guitars. Remember when you were cool and you were going to like do something? You're just going to like not play us anymore. And then I went upstairs and the dishes were like, oh, yeah. you're going to be that husband that doesn't even help his wife out with the house. Like, wow, you're that guy. Oh, my God. It, yeah. And I realized everything in the house, you're not going to clean me. You're not going to dust me. You're not going to change my oil. You're like it just everything. So it's dealing with this idea of freedom. Like what is controlling you? What are the voices that are speaking into your life? Who is making you get up and do things you don't want to do? Um, the, the next one mm -hmm. is choosing mindfulness and that's, I mean, that's, that's your world, but it's really the, Love that it's one. the gap between stimulus and response, right? It's like, it's yeah. being present. This thing just happened. How long can you extend the gap between what just happened and before you respond? Right. And the more you mm -hmm. can lengthen that, then you begin to get control autonomy. And that's so much strength. Yeah. That's why what your message is so valuable. You're teaching people in a, in a responsive, reactive world, Whew. right? Just slow, slow down. down. Sit in it. Don't Sit be in reactive. It for a and when that guy cuts <laughs> you off breath. in traffic, and you start yeah. screaming. Oh, I live in South Florida. There you go. Right, but but when you <laughs> Miami drivers, when you start, when you start world. banging, you definitely need mindfulness. <laughs> but if you start banging on the steering wheel and yelling and screaming, here's two things that are important. Oh, no. That driver can't hear you. It doesn't change their behavior at all. All it does for you is gives you a stroke, right? It gives you heart heart issues. But if they cut you off and you mm -hmm. slowly exhale and you lighten your grip on your wheel just a just a hair and you say a quick prayer, God help them get to the hospital before their you know his wife dies. Then what, I get to make up whichever mm -hmm. story I want about that driver. Whichever. Mindfulness is whew, I'm gonna I'm, before I respond. I'm going to do it with my kids. I'm going to be mindful before I respond to my spouse. I'm, I'm going to be mindful before I take on a work project. It's just this extending this gap, right? And the next one is health and healing. And that is if your body's not healthy, um, I mean, our health metrics mm -hmm. in this country are a disaster. 
um, if your body's not healthy, yeah. it's going to be trying to get your attention to let you know we're not okay, right? If you haven't dealt with childhood traumas, your body's going to constantly be trying to respond to those things. And then the final one, um, which I didn't expect, but has, has become the one that people want to talk about the most, and that is you have uh -huh. to choose belief. Um, and that's this idea that, um, you know, for all of human history, people walked outside of their tent and they looked to the sky and said, dear God or dear gods, please mm -hmm. rain or my family will die. And now we have running water in our house. And it used to, you know, it had to have the perfect amount of sun and rain or your crops didn't come in and your whole tribe didn't make it. Yeah. Um, now we just have Uber Eats. And so we've gotten very arrogant that we are the center of the universe. And I believe that the self is crumbling under the weight of it's all about us. And so this idea of choose belief, mm -hmm. my, my family, we're Christian. I'm not prescribing a belief to people. Um, I've got my atheist yeah, friends yeah. that they just believe in something to, or like believe in a higher power, yes, like spirituality. You have to take a knee to something bigger than you and understand at the physiological level, this whole life isn't about me. And so like you constantly cycle through these six things on a daily basis, on a regular basis, it's like brushing your teeth. Um, who's 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 owning me today? Where am I being short with somebody I love? What do I need to do to make sure my health is OK? Um, and for most of us, two or three of these are, are pretty simple, no brainers, a two, two, a couple of them are pretty challenging and one or two of them are a nightmare. They're really hard. And, um, those are ones you got to lean into directly. I, I loved all the choices, of course. Um, but I like that you title them choices, right? Like you're still giving people the opportunity to choose. Yeah. Like I can give you all this information, but it's up to you to choose to use it and really put it in your daily practice um so I, I love how you perfectly line these up and and i can see how they're very relatable or they can be very relatable to anyone mm -hmm. with anxiety so i congratulate you on that thank you um i wanted to take it a little bit personal drawing from your own experience how did you personally overcome challenges how do you um manage your own anxiety or your day-to-day? -day? Do you have any um, mindfulness practices that you like to do on a daily basis? Yeah, I'm going back all the way to the beginning. Um, the story I always told was the story of uh, me walking from the parking lot of where I worked to my office and then just turning around, going back to the parking lot, getting in a car and driving three hours away to meet with a buddy who was a physician and just said, I'm not okay. And I told that story for years. And as I un I was talking to somebody about that time, and then all of a sudden I started to remember the things that happened before that. About a year before that, I started meeting with a guy named Randy. He was a bioethics professor and he was a monk. And me and him and a number of other college students would get together and meditate every week. And my friend Slade oh, would meet me at the gym at five every morning. And it was so annoying because without a doubt, he was all, he was as true as the sunrise. He was going to be there. He was consistent and calm and kind. <laughs> and he was going to ask me things like, what'd you do for your wife this week? Did you do anything special for her this week? And sometimes I would do things knowing he was going to ask me about it. Right. I was practicing what husbandry was like. Right. And, um, okay. <laughs> but I, he, I had a group of guys that we got together once a week and just talked about theology and physics and whatever. They were a bunch of nerdy professors. We all were. And, um, we got, I was like physics. Yeah. We got dark beer and just talked about <laughs> all of our nerd stuff. Exactly. <laughs> um, but <laughs> what I realized is I had a mindfulness practice. I had began to solve for connection. I, I was lonely and I started having friends, I started exercising, moving my body and having somebody cheer me on and somebody held me accountable. And so those are the things that then allowed me to go sit with a doctor and do the hard work that I needed to do to deal with some pasta. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 10, 15 years now, um, a non-anxious life doesn't inoculate you from tragedy. You're still going to get family members who pass mm -hmm. away. You're still going to have kids who get sick or don't get the part in the play or don't get into the school they want. They, life is still ugly and messy yeah. and hard. What I would tell triggers are everywhere. they're everywhere. But what I would tell people is I'm not anxious right now. I can be really mad. I can be really sad, but I'm not anxious. My body's not leaving me to try to go solve these problems for me. It's staying with me. And so practices that I have pretty regularly are to connect with other people, 
to have a regular meditation practice. Exercise is an important thing. And then nature has really become a very, very important thing for me is getting outside and being plugged in with nature. Those are just non-negotiables yeah, for nature me. Nature would be my favorite. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, me, myself, I do some yoga, um, anything that has to do with nature, beach, hike. You know, sometimes living in South Florida, we don't have the mountains right. or the hiking. You have an ocean, though. <laughs> so yeah, for yeah. me, it would be beach. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it would be the beach. <laughs> um, but it, again, yeah, it's a non-negotiable. It def definitely helps to to regulate my whole system yeah. That's excellent. <laughs> can't live without the yoga um when in regards to self-worth and well-being the idea that you are worth being well is powerful why in your view do many people struggle to believe in their own worth our i can't think of a more prominent cultural message in the western world then you're insufficient. Your diet's insufficient. Your activity's insufficient. Your, the way you think about this is insufficient. Your effort is insufficient. Your lovability is insufficient. Your attractiveness or your beauty is insufficient because everyone's trying to sell you a solution. Um, and if you go, if you're a person of faith, it's, you know, the, you know, you didn't do this right. And so mm, you better get right. Or otherwise, man, you're going to be tortured for eternity. Mm -hmm. Like there's these messages that just communicate, you're not, you're not there. You're not there. You're not enough. And I think what's happened culturally is that people have gotten exhausted and they've just said, well, then I quit. I'm out. That's what burnout is. Yeah. Like take me. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, well then fine. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do today? I'm just gonna eat ice cream and have fun. I'm just going to stay at home because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in COVID, we, when the great Mike Rose said this back when COVID we told 38 million Americans that their job was essential, which means we told mm -hmm. 300 million Americans, you know what? Just go home. We don't even need you. We'll just mail checks. We're good. And so people went home yeah. and they're like, I don't have a purpose. I don't have a role. I'm just here. I'm just right. It's this exhale, yeah. this well, fine. Then I'm just going to Netflix myself to death. And mm -hmm. I think people have just cashed out. So, I don't know that I can start any sort of wellness practice or any sort of mindfulness practice unless it rests on a foundation of, hey, you're worth the discomfort you're about to enter into for a, an incredible life on the other side of this thing. And most people have yeah. never heard that before. They've just been told you're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. And so every conversation in my life, my goal is like. All like whether I'm talking to some, a waitress, talking to somebody at, you know, at the fa at a fast food restaurant or talking to somebody in a um, uh, in a life or death situation. I always want that person mm -hmm. to walk away from their interaction with me feeling like that guy valued me, which means I got value. Yeah. I got value. Exactly. I mean, I think it says uh, a lot about who you are and your personality, if you're able to talk to different people and provide that message, right? Regardless if they're, you mentioned a waitress or a million people speaking sure. or people reading your book. So um, I find that's amazing. And I, I, I do have to agree with you when the whole pandemic hit. Um, it definitely made a lot of people feel like they, they didn't have a purpose. But I also feel that for the turnaround, some people were able to pause their job and say okay now i don't have an option but to look within right so what do i want to do with my life and there was a lot of career changes and people finding their purpose so i think where there's a sad there's a positive um obviously it depends how you took it but i so i was doing school counseling and i had to do virtual school counseling and i saw a lot of kids get hit by it but i saw the goods and the bad right, yeah, some yeah. kids obviously mental health mm -hmm. diagnosis which is struggling. Like it was a struggle to, to see them online and try to do counseling online. And then you would have the ones that were thriving. Cause they're like, Oh, I don't have to deal with any of the bullies or the dumb people at school. I'm doing great. I just want to stay home. <laughs> right, right. Right. Well, and I, <laughs> I was like, all right, maybe virtual schooling's for you. Yeah. Well, I, I, and, and I guess over, we'll see over the next 20, 30 years, how it bears out. I wonder mm -hmm. how many folks, um, cause we, we had the great resignation. Everybody's just was like, you know what? If my job, if I don't have a purpose, I'm going to do what I really want to do. 
But then we mm-hmm. had what they called the great, um, oh God, it was basically the great regret. Everyone thought that the grass would be greener somewhere else. And as a, as a mental health provider, you know that like this, the oh, idea is, yes. um, one of the core counseling philosophies is, hey, wherever you go, you go with you, right? So you can, you can cheat on your partner and, and be with somebody else. At some point, you're going to walk by the bathroom mirror and you're going to see yourself. And you're going to be in that new relationship too. And if you're not okay with you, yeah. you're going to go with you everywhere. And so everybody quit their job and for more money, for more stay at home options, for more whatever. And then there was this big wave circled back like, oh, it was me. I went with me. Um, yeah. Can I get my old job back? Right. So I, I wonder how much yeah. of the I'm just going to scratch who I used to be and, and finally go after the real me. I wonder yeah. how much of that was a flight response. I'm going to run from who I was right. instead of sitting in it and going, I feel powerless and this is scary. What's, what's, what can I control? You know what I can control? I'm going to go uh, back to online school. I'm actually going to start seeing a counselor, even though it's, it's online. I'm going to start doing some of these things. And I think you, you're onto yeah. it. Kids are really intuitive. They, if, if they're allowed to, they'll follow their bodies and what feels, what feels safe. Right. And good on you. That yeah. There's some students who are like, you know what? I don't like bullies. So this is good. I can learn my algebra yeah. in peace finally. <laughs> they're like, I'm doing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're like, their grades went yeah. up. They didn't have to socialize. And all this time while we keep feeding them as you have to socialize, it's like, okay, well, maybe you could socialize outside of school, extracurricular activities, or maybe you're just happy being with your siblings at home. Um, but it was very interesting to watch um, how some kids did better than others um, in regards to the mental health. I also believe depends on the family home system. Are, no right? question. Gotta be parents. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Big time, big yeah. time, big time. Mm-hmm. So, so thank you for the parents that held it together oh, <laughs> during the pandemic. Real. Very helpful. <laughs> okay, for okay for when we talk about the principles, um, for those successfully implementing the principles outlined in your book, what transformations can they expect in their life? So, what expectations can somebody have after reading this book and and trying to implement the steps by steps? Um, for some folks. It is, they find themselves for a season, especially falling asleep at 8.30 or 9 o'clock because their bodies have been fighting for so long. It's, they're just, they just fall asleep and it feels, it feels strange. Um, I remember one time talking to a therapist and she, I was, we were going, I'd been through some heavy, heavy therapy on some pretty gnarly stuff. And she said, what do you feel? And I said, the words I'm going to say, I know are clinically inaccurate, but I feel depressed. I feel like everything's kind of running low, like this thymic. And she okay. said, she smiled real big and she said, yeah, this is what normal feels like. You've been running so spun up for so long that you're going to have to practice feeling whew, peace, right? And some people, yeah. I track everything. I'm kind of a nerd and I've seen my, my heart rate beats per minute go down. Like my body is just, whoosh. um, they're, oh, they're physiological con like uh, my caffeine intake sometimes is much, much less. My body doesn't need to be amped and wild. And I find, um, a, a, a just, um, trust. I'm able to just turn things off. The biggest one though, I'll tell you the one that is the most important for me. And was kind of like my dirty little secret for a while. Um, I had this, show about relationships. It's often about parenting and marriage. And it took off out from under us, it turned into this big old thing. And I was, I'm an introvert yeah. academic and it just spun up and we didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. And the big dirty secret was that my <laughs> eight year old, she was six at the time. My daughter wouldn't hug me. She would, she refused. And, um, I don't yell. I don't, I'm not loud in our house. I'm not, there's like, I don't hit my kid. I, I couldn't figure it out. I think I'm a really good dad. Mm-hmm. When one day I was talking to my wife about it and my wife was way smarter than me. She was Dr. Deloney long before I was. Um, but she <laughs> said, there's something about that little girl, that little tiny human being, her body has detected you as not safe. And I said, but I'm the safest man in her life. And she goes, I know that. And I think she knows it cognitively, but her body says not safe. So I went to a trauma therapist and I just said, hey, this I'm sick of this. Mm-hmm. What's the deal? And we had, I had some choosing health and healing. There was some stuff I had never told anybody that happened ever. I'd never told anyone ever. 
And it was months of some pretty gnarly um, walking through fire. And it was a few months ago now that I a sentence shot out of my mouth one evening that I couldn't believe I had said. And I was doing something and I said out loud with a laugh, Josephine, that's my daughter, Josephine, get off me. Because now I'm a human jungle gym for her. I'm her safest okay. place, right? And so it's oh, it's this, her body now feels there's not this nuclear reactor in my chest that can go off at any mm -hmm. minute. And it's not yelling, but it's that intensity that melts that little girl. And now she knows, oh, that man is safe. He's firm. He's strong. He shows up, yeah. but he's he's not going to set off. And so it, it, that is what people ask, like, what's, what's a non-anxious life feel like? It's walking in your front door and laughing. It's walking in your front door and your kids show up and you're in a sword fight you didn't even know you were in. It's, it's just peace. It's just peace. And I don't yeah. think we even have a picture of that in our culture anymore. Yeah. No, I, I don't believe we do. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to your opinion, um, which came up, because, you know, obviously you have children, you've gone through anxiety. And there's this, there's people that believe that to have anxious children is because you have anxious parents. What are your beliefs on that? Or through your experience, what have you uh, seen? My experience has been if, if, if somebody says, hey, I've got um, anxious kids got anxious, um, especially early teens. Um, what do I do? The first thing I say is fix your marriage. That's always a first. Kids mm -hmm. absorb the tension in their home. If kids have anxiety and you've handed them a smartphone and given them access to the entire world, and more importantly, you've given the the entire world access to your kid, that that's a that's a an amount of stimulus and information. That, that that little developing brain simply cannot handle. It's too much. Um, and so I think there's a few right off the top that um, are really, really major. But I don't know a lot of anxious kids. I haven't met a lot of anxious kids that mm -hmm. have connected super tight, um, stable, um, as Becky Kennedy calls them, sturdy parents. I just don't know kids because yeah. they can anchor off of that and repel all over the place. Disappointed kids, mad kids, sad kids, rambunctious kids, hyper kids, of course, but not pathologically yeah. anxious kids. And of course, um, as, a, as a school counselor, you deal with the kids, what I would call outside the bell curve, right? Those that truly have mm -hmm. neurological challenges, right? That truly have, they had some traumatic childhoods and their brains are not pathological they're just trying to respond to the chaos that they grew up in mm -hmm. right and so i think that's yeah that's i mean that's everywhere that's everywhere um but that's been my experience what's your experience oh i my experience is that family is everything right yeah. <laughs> i work from a very um systemic way so i always look into the living situation uh who raised you traumatic experiences. So from my experience, what I've seen is that, like you said, a kid with anxiety most likely has gone through something or something is happening at home or it was taught, right? Like just always being in a fight or flight state uh, or it was not taught to regulate their emotions or how to handle certain situations. The resilience is not there. Um, but I, I definitely see a pattern of, you know, parents um kind of transmitting some sort of anxious behavior into the kids yeah. and i think yeah, the challenge is sure. folks like you and i have is when we tell parents that we live in such a shame induced society that they it's easy to shut down like oh i'm the worst mom ever or i'm the worst dad mm -hmm. instead of saying yeah. and going Whew, okay then i got some work to do if i really love my kid we're gonna figure this one out yeah. they, like now i've got a roadmap and the roadmap is me awesome um and, and I think that's 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 my hope for parents when they get that kind of information that the greatest gift you can give your kids mm -hmm. is not another electronic device, not another that you show up to every single soccer game they ever have. Um, the greatest gift you can give your kids is a non anxious presence, a stable, a stable mom yeah. and dad. Um, they boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. A bounded system that the kids feel secure and safe and they know it's coming now. Whew, now, Very now we're into it. That's right.
Yeah, boundary is very important. Um, well, we're talking about emotion uh, regulations and maybe identifying some of the patterns or thought patterns in regards to anxiety, right? How can an individual identify and challenge a negative thought that contributes to their anxiety? Uh, that's one of my favorites. Do you have any yeah. tips what, that they could do? One of my favorite yeah. things. Um, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's old CBT stuff, but um, it can get really mm. gnarly and overwhelming. Um, and really the person I think you brought it home for me is the great David Kessler who writes on grief. Um, but it's this idea that I can't control what I would call the lightning bolt. I can't control that thought that just zaps in your head. It's the end of time or that picture of your spouse with that other person or that picture of your kid when they were in the hospital. You, you can't stop that lightning bolt. You can stop. You can choose after that initial lightning bolt to not meditate on it, to not make it your entire life, your entire world. And that means you have to be willing to let that thought go. What does that mean? Like what the way I coach people is it's often helpful to get out of your body, write it down, get out of your head and write it on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Often it's important to challenge it. That's the old CBT thing. Is this true? Is this a true statement? Are you the yeah. worst mom that yeah, ever like, lived? Look at facts. Yeah, is this facts? Is this true? Are you the worst mom that ever lived? No. Are you a terrible dad? No. Okay. Let's just, then we're going to stop with that because it's not true. And any any other thinking we're going to do on this is a choice. We're choosing to just mire in the muck and be miserable. I'm not going to do that. Sometimes in my house, especially in the past, I don't do it much anymore, but I would be walking through my living room, having an imaginary conversation with somebody, like one of my bosses, that of course I'm super winning the art. <laughs> the, the, like, I'm just going to tell them that. The one way oh, argument. Dude, I'm dominating it. It's just <laughs> mic drop after mic drop. I would literally <laughs> say out loud in my house, just walking through the living room, like I would yell, no, not do it. Like I would just say the word no really loud. And that was my way of catching myself. My wife would just roll her eyes. I would just, but that was my way of catching myself and saying, I'm not engaging okay. in this. Whew. And then I think the third thing after you ask yourself, is this true or not? It's really important, especially in our current world where because of our phones, we're aware of every tragic moment around the globe and our bodies aren't designed to absorb all of that. You have news stations that mm -hmm. say we will run a murder tonight, find one. And so if there's no murders in Miami, you're going to get, you're going to get a story in the Miami news about a shooting of a police officer in Milwaukee in Seattle. And, but we will cover a murder and it begins to shift our okay. default setting to everyone's getting murdered all the time everywhere. Right. It's just not, it's just not true. Oh Yeah. And so I have to, on a piece of paper, write down what of this can I control? Most of the time, it's nothing. I can't control what's going on overseas. I can't control what's happening in another state. Yeah. I can control what's happening in my home. I can control my thoughts and my actions. And that's about it. And that's a terrifying, yeah. powerless feeling. But that's where the growth happens. Yeah. You can control switching the channel. Yeah, you can, yeah. There, every device. I control not watching the right. news. <laughs> Me neither. Every device has this awesome feature called the off button. You can just hit it, and it just turns the whole thing off. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Or you can do your preference, yeah. right? Like I know the Apple News, you can put your preference. Mine's mental health. <laughs> Definitely not uh, murders, cases, right? Exactly. And politics. Exactly. Be informed, but again, it's just so much information. Yeah. Every yeah. day. It's just too much. Yeah. It's more than I can process. And too here's much. the deal. Water's great. Water's so good. Floods kill everybody. You can drown. Yeah, you can drown. And so, yeah, some new informa information's great. News is good. Um, that much of it is will kill you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take as take as you need, not more. Great. Well, I would I would say this comes with the word balancing, right? Balancing your life. Balancing your emotions, self-care, responsibilities. Your book discusses the concept of self was never intended to hold up the universe. Can you explain how an individual can strive to balance the self-care and the responsibilities, in your opinion? Yeah, I think the responsibilities have to be bound. Um, what am I responsible for and what can I actually do? Most of us responsibilities become this ever moving target. Like I'm responsible for my health and then I'm responsible for my spouse's attitude. And then I'm responsible for my kids' performances. Then I'm responsible for our government. It just get it, it's a moving target. 
And so I think it's important to, to constantly come back to what am I responsible for? And am I doing those things well? One prominent psychologist says, clean your room before you start lecturing the public on politics. If you can't handle your house, then you have no business going out into the street telling other people how to live. If your checkbook, if you owe $400,000 in student loans and mortgages and car notes, don't talk to me about the federal government spending problem until your house is in order, right? Yeah. And so I think the responsibility line keeps moving. So I think it's important to, to, to have boundaries around what you're responsible for, what you can actually make an impact on. And self-care, I think, has been... It's been so commoditized. Overrated. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's majoring in the minors. It's, it's, it's cool, mm -hmm. but like, man, I, I, it's been using out of context. Yes. I feel. Yeah. Like, man, I really want to know about red light therapy and I really want to know about your cold plunge. I really do. I like both of those things, but let's get your, your relationships healthy and your diet right. And you exercising on a regular basis. Let's start there. Hmm. Let's not, my friend Lane calls it, um, stepping over hundred dollar bills to pick up nickels. Like let's, let's actually, let's deal with a big rock. Yeah. And the big rocks are boring. Getting up and going to yoga every single day after a while is not exciting. It's not invigorating. It's a thing that you do yeah. you and you know, it pays off over time. It's like an investment in a 401. Yeah. Right. And so I think, um, this idea of self-care, what are the things that I need to do to be whole, to show up for my job, my family, my work, for those responsibilities that I've mm -hmm. outlined? And for it can be any number of things for any number of people, but I think it's being intentional about what those things are and not majoring in the minors. Yeah, exactly. And then everybody has their own definition of self-care because people think it has to be this – I don't know, this trip is self-care, this big investment or a spa day. It could just be going for, go a, for walk. a walk. Yeah. Like maybe you work from home every day. <laughs> you just need to go out for that 10 minute walk or just walk your dog. Right. You know, it's, it could be simple because right. that's that's another stereotype that it has to be this big expense or this big activity. Right. Well, and it yeah. was recently I read and I couldn't believe it. I actually called an expert because I didn't believe it. A buddy of mine. And he's like, yeah, it's actually true. <laughs> Give or take. <laughs> Running five miles or walking five miles burns about the same calories. You just get done with one no faster. Way. And so the benefit of running is you can run five miles much faster than you can walk five miles. So most of us don't have time. But on a calorie for calorie burn, it's about okay. the same. And I was like, no way. Because that really is frustrating to me, That's man. Crazy. But um, <laughs> I've been running all the time. <laughs> exactly. But these, like, like you say, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be this big okay. momentous thing. Um, I've really gotten into rucking this year. Um, it's a great Florida company with go ruck groups, but it's a backpack oh. that they design and you have weights in it and you just go for a walk, man. It's amazing. And I get a great workout and I'm tired oh. when I get home and I get, by the way, I get no, this is an advertisement. I'm not getting one penny from them for anything. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but it's one of those, Oh, that's what the human body's designed to do is to chase something down and to bring it back miles and miles and miles mm -hmm. to the tribe so we can all share this so my body's designed to do cool i'm yeah. just gonna do that on a regular basis i don't have to get some fancy equipment by the way i have a gym full of fancy equipment in my house so i'm talking out of both sides of my mouth but so you don't you don't full disclosure you don't have to have, have, have a whole you don't gym. have to have that right <laughs> get a backpack put some weights in go yeah. for a walk and so I, yeah we way over over complicated and we skip the boring menial hard stuff trying to find what's the right essential oil for this moment. To, you know, I just go for a walk, go for a walk. <laughs> and when you get back, then put yeah. on essential oils and, and let them light up your life a little bit. But yeah, you're exactly right. We just get those things yeah. out of whack. I want to close the conversation um, with a little message or advice to our audience. Um, for those that may be struggling with anxiety or maybe for a family member that has someone who's struggling with anxiety, what would, um, your message be like what would you want them to take out of this whole conversation if you're struggling with anxiety or if you love someone who's struggling with anxiety i think the question to start with is what if their body is right what if your body is right what is your body trying to protect you from and that is a much more instructive path than starting from a place of your body's broken and it's ruined and we have to fix it. So if 
we look at anxiety like a smoke detector or the gas light on your dashboard in your car. That doesn't mean your car is broken. That doesn't mean your gas, your, 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 anything's wrong. It just means you got to put gas in the car. Let's begin to ask ourselves, what's our body trying to protect us from? And what if our body's right? Then we will get into the harder, oof, what am I going to have to change in my life so that my alarms aren't ringing off the hook all the time? I, I would um, definitely agree that that perspective will definitely have a shift on how you view and perceive anxiety. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that analogy. My Spanish gets in between sometimes. Analogy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, after growing up in well, Texas my whole life and then coming to, to Nashville, I'll never forget um, <laughs> I was here for like a week and a uh, waiter came uh -huh. by and had the picture and I just like, Unamas. And he looked at me like, <laughs> what? And I, I looked at him and I was like, Unamas. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I was like, oh, geez, I'm not in Texas anymore. I was like, one more, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then he, right? yeah. So no, it, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel at home. So thank yeah. you. Gracias. Yeah. De nada. Yeah. <laughs> a la orden. <laughs> no, I, I really want to thank you. Thank you again for coming and having this important conversation. And thank you for your book. I think um, anyone that reads it will definitely find value in it. So if you're watching, listening, um, please read it. If you have not, um, please go get it. We're going to put all the information, right? And let us know what you think. Let us know if you're going through anxiety, if any of what we talked today helped you at all. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.